The following audio is from Christian Heritage Church. More information about Christian Heritage Church is available at chctoday.com. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 this morning, so you can just leave your Bible open to that place. If you don't carry a Bible, take out your smartphone, find the app on it, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 on your smartphone or your tablet or your other device. It's great what electronics does for us today, amen? No matter where I am, I've got the Word with me. Even if it may not be this copy, there's a copy in my pocket on that smartphone, amen? You know, last week I announced to you that I'm beginning a new series talking about the grace of giving. And it's interesting whenever I give you a preview of what we're going to be doing, some of the reactions I get. So I chuckled on Thursday when I got an anonymous letter, and the letter said, if you preach on giving, we're not coming. And I thought, well, that's interesting. See, I had two choices. I could either let it bother me or I could just laugh. So I chose to laugh. So I rehearsed this in my mind. And I thought, okay, this is my message to that anonymous person. I hate anonymous letters because I can't respond. Anyway, adios, hasta la vista, ciao, arriva dorce. Don't let the door hit you. And, uh, all right, leave it at that. Come on, we need to understand the grace of giving. And we need to understand that there are principles contained in the Scripture that have the power to revolutionize our lives. Scriptural principles that have the power to break cycles of poverty, to break ways of thinking that had held people bondage for years and years and years. As most of you know, I spent a lot of time on the mission field. And it was interesting to me in all those travels and journeys and crusades that I noticed a common factor. It didn't matter if it was in Latin America or Asia. It didn't matter if it was in India or Africa. It didn't matter where it was at. There is a principle that goes along with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a principle called redemptive lift. That when you come to Jesus and you begin understanding and obeying the Word of God and putting His Word at work in your life, your life changes. And it changes for the better. So many times we only look at it in terms of eternity, but I've got news for you. When we apply the Word of God to our lives every day in the here and now, our life changes for the better right now. Amen. And that's something I want you to understand as we walk through the next four weeks, that obedience to the Word always brings blessing. And anybody who doesn't want the blessing of God, well, they're just kind of special. You know what I mean? Just a little special. Uh, Someone said to me, well, God isn't going to bless me because of my family, because of my past, because of my background. He can't bless me. I've got news for you. That's why we call it grace. It's grace because it doesn't matter where you have been or what you have done. It's grace, grace, powerful grace that liberates, that sets free, that transforms when we choose to put our life in God's hand. Matter of fact, there's a store in the Old Testament. You'll find it in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This guy only had two verses written about him in the entire Bible, just two. But it's a powerful two verses. The Bible talks about a man by the name of Jabez, and it says Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother called his name Jabez, now get this, because I bore him in pain. He didn't have a good beginning. His mama wasn't really thrilled that he was here. He didn't have a great name pronounced over him. I call you Jabez because you caused me a lot of grief and pain. Now that's quite a name, isn't it? But Jabez didn't allow his beginnings... The name pronounced over him, the, the statements of his mother, oh, someone, someone needs to be hearing this this morning. He didn't allow what his mama said about him to affect his life and his destiny. Because even though his may, name may have been Jabez and he was born in pain, he realized, I'm an Israelite. That means I'm a child of God. That means there are promises that are for me and I'm going to stand upon them. Verse 10, he said, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And I love the last phrase of that verse. And God granted him what he requested. So you need to understand when we're talking about the grace of giving, It's not so that we can get more money in the church, although that's going to happen. It's not so that someone around you can be blessed, although that's going to happen. 
is so that you and I can understand the principles of the word. We can reach out and take them as Jabez of old. And we dare to say, oh, God of Israel, will you not bless me just a little, but bless me and bless me and bless me. Enlarge my territory. Keep me from evil so I don't cause pain. And the God of Israel granted his request. That's good stuff. That should speak to someone in this room this morning that you understand God desires to honor his word over your life. So before we go any further, will you show that video for me, please? It's entitled, We Give. Watch this. That's the reason we give. Amen. I love that video. Powerful stuff. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Let me pause and tell you that Macedonia was the poorest of the poor. Keep that in your mind as we read these scriptures and as we walk through this series of messages. They were the poorest of the poor. That in great trial of affliction, their abundance of their joy, their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. What a contradiction in statements that you see in verse 2. Read it one more time. In a great trial of affliction, affliction, their abundance of joy, their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Interesting stuff. For I bear witness that, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Did you catch what Paul said? He said, these folks were the poorest of the poor. Their life was horrible. It was rough. It was indescribable. Yet they begged us to allow them to give. Wow. That ought to rock your world this morning when you read that scripture. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, and not only as we had hoped... But they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So how were they able to have this attitude? I think he made it very clear in verse 5, didn't he? By first giving themselves to the Lord. They understood the principle that everything we are, everything we have, the sum total of our existence and being comes from God and belongs to God. So we freely give it back to God. Not mine to begin with. It's his. He said, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by the gift of God, by the will of God, pardon me. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, he would also complete this grace in you as well. As you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and diligence and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, and that you through his poverty might become rich. 
I had a mentor once tell me that I can tell your relationship with God or the story of your spiritual life by looking at your checkbook. There's a lot of truth to that. No doubt about it, the way we handle money is a mark of discipleship. And in the current economy, we understand that it's critical. We understand how to handle properly our resources and that which God has given to you and I. So the goal of this series is not to give you step-by-step principles about how to handle your money, but rather to speak to your heart. For I believe if the heart doesn't change, it doesn't matter what the hand does. Matter of fact, let me say it this way. If the heart doesn't first change and we continue to do things out of duty or obligation, we're simply falling into the trap of religion and legalism rather than flowing in the grace of Jesus Christ. So my goal is to speak to your heart over the next four Sundays. I'm going to make you four promises in this series. Four promises. Number one, I promise to preach the word. Nothing else. Someone said, well, you're preaching on giving. You're just going to tell us how to give more money. No, I'm going to preach the word. See, the Bible contains over 800 references to money. Jesus actually spoke about money more than the topics of heaven or hell. Interesting, isn't it? And because it is an issue that's close to our heart, then it's also an issue that we need to deal with. And it's also a biblical issue. Number two, I promise to be kind. I'm aware that there are folks under the sound of my voice, some watching online today, some who will listen by DVD or CD later on, who have been in a religious system where all they hear is give and give and then give some more. I understand that, so I promise to be kind. And while I do believe stewardship is a sign of discipleship, matter of fact, it's really the only area of our life in Christianity that we can't fake. It's black and white. I believe that I promise to be kind to you. Number three, I promise not to ask you to do something I myself am not willing to do. I'm not going to call you to a deeper level of commitment than where Yvonne and I are already at. The disdain many of us have when it comes to sermons and teachings on money is the fact we think some preacher is going to ask us to give and then he's going to get in his jet and fly off to his mansion. That's not happening here. You need to understand that. That's not happening here, all right? That's not what we're dealing with. We tithe off of our gross income and we do it because that's what God has asked us to do. And then we give to missions and other opportunities above and beyond that because that's what God has asked us to do. So I will not call you to a deeper level of commitment than what we are committed to as well. And then number three, I promise if you'll listen to the word of God, if you will take the challenge from God's word, I promise you an extraordinary life. Not because of this preacher, but because we serve a good God who says, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you. Do you understand the word says, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. Now, I don't necessarily think that means worldly goods. I think that means you grow in grace and in mercy. I think that means you deepen and broaden in your relationships. I think that means you find ways to show the love of God in and around you on a daily basis. And yes, he blesses you other ways as well. But we need to understand when we obey... God blesses us. That's a promise of the scripture. And I guarantee you, if you will simply make a commitment to follow God through his word with your finances, you're going to find an extraordinary life. Why? Because there's great things awaiting on the other side of generosity. When you choose to be generous, it's amazing how generous God is with you. When you stop holding things in your hands so tightly and give it to him. Some of the reasons that we're afraid of teachings and preachings on money are due to misunderstanding. Sometimes we misunderstand biblical principles. Sometimes preachers have a fear of being misunderstood. I really don't grasp our deal with that, to be real honest with you. I'm going to lay it out there, and then it's up to you to pick it up or not. That's not on me. That's on you. So whether you misunderstand or not, that's on you. And then we have a misunderstanding of what grace really is leads to fear, and it leads to you and I pulling back rather than pressing in. Kind of reminds me of the story of the old farmer who was hit broadside on his tractor by a semi-truck. And when he decided to sue the insurance company to get some damages, he was in court, and the lawyer for the insurance company said to him, Now, sir, didn't you say at the scene of the accident to the police officer that you were just fine? The farmer said, well, you need to understand, I just loaded my best cow, Bessie, in the trailer. We were going down the road, and the lawyer said, wait a minute. I didn't ask about your best cow, Bessie. 
I said, when the policeman came to the scene of the accident, didn't you say you were fine? He said, well, you need to understand. I just loaded my best cow, Bessie, in the trailer, and we were going down the road. The lawyer said, I didn't ask you about your cow. I asked you, didn't you say you were fine? Your Honor, make him answer the question. The judge was kind of interested at this point. So he said, I think I want to hear about his best cow, Bessie. Tell the story. So the farmer began telling the story. He said, well, I just loaded my best cow, Bessie, in the trailer, hooked it on behind the tractor. We were going down the road, and the semi broadsided us. I went into one ditch. Bessie went and went into the other ditch. I could hear her over there moaning. I knew she was fatally wounded. I was busted up and broken myself and hurting like crazy. Didn't know what was going to happen. Just a few minutes, a policeman arrived on the scene. He got out of his car. He heard Bessie over in the ditch. He walked over to her, and he was... He knew in just a moment that she wasn't going to make it. So he pulled out his handgun and shot her right between the eyes. And then with his gun still in his hand, he walked across the road to me in the other ditch. And he said, how you doing? (laughs) Well, what would you have said? He said, fear, fear brings misunderstanding. We need to understand fear brings misunderstanding. And can I tell you? There's nothing to fear when you're dealing with God. There is nothing to fear when you put yourself into the hand of the Almighty who loves you and cares for you and cares about you. So let's look at the biblical mandates for giving that we find in the Scripture. We can find it first in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 14, 23. Moses said the reason we bring tithe is so that we can show God is first in our life. To keep our priorities straight. Corey Ten Boom said, hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Pretty good wisdom. You know, people in today's age, people living under grace and living in the New Testament dispensation often say, well, tithing is an Old Testament principle, therefore I'm not going to obey it. I love it when I hear that. I love it. And then we have another camp that says, I so love everything Israeli and Judaism, I want to live that way. So I've got a word for all of you this morning, all right? When you look at the scripture from the Old Testament, you'll find that number one, there is the Lord's tithe or the Levite's tithe commanded. That's found in Numbers 18, pretty much the whole chapter. And then in Leviticus 27, 30 through 31, the word says, and all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. And then you can go to Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, and read through verse 12. And the Bible says, will a man rob God? Yeah, you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithe and in offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this. I love this, because this is a command with promise. You know what a command with promise means? It means if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to do what I said I would do. And I'm interested in getting in on God doing what he said he will do. Can you say amen? He said if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. They'll pray over you, anoint with you with oil. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. That's a command with promise. First command with promise is in the Ten Commandments. Obey your father and mother, and your life shall be long upon the earth. A command with promise. Well, in Malachi, we find another command with promise. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Can I say it one more time? If you don't want the blessing of the Lord on your life, you're some kind of special. I want the blessing of the Lord on my life. I want to obey what he's told me to do. I want to walk in his commandments. I want to follow his statutes so that I can live in the blessing that he's decreed he will pour out upon my life. And then he goes on to say, this is the rest of that promise. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. That's great stuff. I don't need to read anything else. I need no other motivation other than God said, if you do what I ask, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to open the windows of heaven. I'm going to make sure your crops don't fail. Your vines always produce. I will make sure to drive the devourer from your door if you do what I ask you to do. 
Love the way you're shouting now, but that's good stuff. Right out of the Word of God. So we understand there is a tithe taught in the Old Testament. But if you're living under Jewish rule, it doesn't stop with just the tithe, which we know is 10%. It goes on in Deuteronomy 12 to tell us about the festival tithe. Now the Jews loved to have festivals and throw parties, right? There were many scattered throughout the year, but they had to be paid for. So that's the reason for the festival tithe. Are you with me? The first tithe is 10%, right? The festival tithe is another 10%, over and above. So we're at 20%, right? Everybody's moaning now. Oh man, where's this guy going with this stuff? Well, I'm not done yet, because there was also a poor tithe. You can find that in Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29, where every three years they were commanded to give another 10%. So that's 3.3% per year. That takes us, are you ready with the math? To 23.3% of your income going to the kingdom of God. But we're not done yet. Because we go on and read in Leviticus 19 that they were instructed to leave the corners of their field unharvested for the poor. So that those who didn't have means could come into their fields and harvest that fruit or that grain and have a substance and a way to live. I really don't know how much that is. If you're in western Kansas, the corner of your field is a lot of land, I'm telling you. So they have circle irrigation systems and those corners are big. I don't know how much that is, but it was another offering or tithe. And then we can read in Numbers 18 about the first fruit offerings where they were instructed to bring the first fruit of all their increase The first sheep, the first calf, the first goat, the first of the grain, the first of the grapes, the first of the figs, whatever provided, bring the first. See, this is truly faith giving. Because God was saying, if you bring the first fruits, now this is over and above the tithe, all right? Bring the first fruits, then you're going to believe me for the remainder of your harvest. That's faith giving. That's faith living. When we understand, if I bring the first fruits of all my increase unto God, then God has, I'm going to say it, God has an obligation to make the rest of it come out good for me as well. Come on, can I be any stronger than that? If I'm going to obey his word, if I'm going to stand on his word, then I'm calling him to account for the rest of my harvest. The rest of my increase. And when I do that, oh, I believe God loves it. Hey, there's a guy that's going to trust me. There's somebody that's going to believe me. There's someone that's going to put me to the test. Oh, let me show them what I can do. But it didn't end there for the Israelites. Because Exodus 25, 1 and 2 talks about bringing a free will offering. So when you read all of this, you understand that very easily what was required from Israel was over 25% of their giving. Very easily. Very easily. And we cringe when God asks us for a tithe. Interesting, isn't it? Here's the principle, the truth. When the heart overflows with grace, even in the Old Testament, it affects our generosity. Do you remember when Moses was equipping the tabernacle and he sent out the call to the people to bring the items they needed, gold and silver and bronze and skins and all kinds of uh, tapestries? And do you remember what happened? It says they were so generous in their giving, Moses had to say, stop, that's enough. We can't take any more. Oh, I'm looking forward to the day and in the time when I can stand up and say, stop, that's enough. We can't take any more. That debt is retired and paid. Stop, that's enough. We can't take any more. You see, when grace invades our hearts, it affects our generosity. When we begin to understand all that God has done for us, it affects who we are. Well, how does that apply to the Israelites? Did you already forget the Exodus series that we spent almost four years on, but it really is just about four months? Did you forget that series already? God brought them out of bondage. He brought them out of being slaves. And he made them a people who were called by his name. He gave them a land that was already planted with crops and vineyards. They moved into houses they didn't build. Oh, come on. When grace touches your heart, you become generous. You become generous. So let's look at the New Testament pattern. You can find Jesus saying it this way in Luke 6, 38. And if you really read Luke 6, 38 and compare it to Malachi chapter 3, there's a lot of similarities. This is what it says. Given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. Well, I kind of like that. How about some good measure? 
pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom, will be poured into your life if you choose to believe the command of God. And then the last verse says, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So the question is, do you want to use a teaspoon or do you want to use a scoop shovel? That's the question. I prefer the scoop shovel method myself. It's a way to get full really fast and let it run over even faster. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Look at it with me one more time because the Bible says, We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now remember, I already told you they were the poorest of the poor. How were they able to give so liberally? How were they able to give so generously? Because of the grace of God bestowed upon them. Do you all see where I'm going with this? This isn't rocket science. This isn't deep theology. It's simply grabbing a hold of the fact that God loved you. He gave his son for you. He died on the cross and on the third day rose again. That your past could be forgiven and your future could be changed. Oh, that's grace. The grace of God bestowed on the Macedonians. That's what made them liberal. That's what made them generous. That's what made them givers. Even though they were the poorest of the poor, they chose to give. Verse 2 says in that chapter, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy in tough times, they were still happy. Can you say that? You see, when the grace of God is bestowed upon you, you can. It doesn't matter the diagnosis. In great affliction, I'm still filled with joy. It doesn't matter the bank balance, even when it's negative, I am still filled with joy. That's what the word is telling us. Filled with joy. (coughs) And their deep poverty abounded in the riches of the liberality. So we need to understand our current state. Listen, I'm going to get in your business right now. Our current financial state does not dictate how we respond to the promise of God. You may be poorer than a church mouse. But when you come with the grace of God, you're going to find something to offer to Him. You're going to find something to give to Him. We need to understand that's what grace does to us when it gets into our heart. When we begin moving and understanding all that God has done for me, I can't do enough to show Him how much I love Him. It just never ends. It goes on and on and on. The grace of God poured out on our lives. They were the poorest of the poor, but they continued to give. An Old Testament example of that is in 1 Kings 7, verses 13 and 14, where the Bible tells about, excuse me, 17, where the Bible tells about Elijah being by the brook Cherith, and the brook dried up, and God said, go down to Zerpeth, there's a widow there that I commanded to take care of you. So he went down, he saw this widow, and she was out gathering sticks. And he said to her, would you bring me a cup of water? Be happy to. Not a big deal. And then he said, would you bring me a little cake along with it? Oops, that's a problem. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. I'll give you what I got plenty of, but don't ask for what I have very little of. That's a big problem. She said, you don't understand. I'm gathering sticks, and she had them in her hand. I'm going to go back and build a fire, and I'm going to take the last of the meal, the flour that I have, The last of the oil that I have, I'm going to bake a small cake, split it with my son. We're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. That's pretty dire, isn't it? That's pretty severe, isn't it? I have one small meal left, and then I'm done. My resources are gone. There's nothing left. There are no more food stamps. There's no one else to ask for money. I'm out of luck. That's it. And you know what that man of God had the audacity to say to her? Blows me away. He said, oh, well and good, but make me a cake first. Take care of me first. Well, how selfish can that be? No, friend, it wasn't selfish. She was teaching a scriptural principle. And the principle is if you'll obey God, God will take care of you. Listen to what he said in that passage of scripture. This is what the Lord says. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth. I've got news for you. You put him to the test. He's going to prove himself every time. Just let him. Just let him show you how good he really is. Let him show you how wonderful he really is. Let him. 
show you that he never disobeys or dishonors his word in and over your life. Truth, there is no one too poor to give. It doesn't matter if you have a quarter or a quarter of a million. No one is too poor to give. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, For I bear witness that according to their ability. Now, he didn't measure it. He just said they gave according to their ability. See, this is where we get stumped, and this is where we stumble. I don't have enough to matter. It's not about how much you have. It's about your ability. Gave according to their ability, and even beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. You see, these folks in Macedonia, they got it. They understood it. They understood that because of the grace that's been bestowed upon us, we then have a responsibility to give according to our ability and even more. And if that happens, we're going to get some more grace. We're going to talk about ministering seed to the sower. You need to be here next week. It's going to be a powerful word. As we understand when we become generous, God becomes generous. When we sow, God brings seed back to us. Bring someone with you next week. It's going to be a powerful word next Sunday morning. So the truth is no one is too poor to give. In fact, in the scripture, the Macedonians were begging for the right, the privilege of participating in this offering. That's an amazing thing. It wasn't Paul wringing his hands, manipulating, twisting their arms up behind their back. No, they understood grace. And because they understood grace, they said, we want to participate. Count me in because I want some more of that. See, this is the truth. When you've given everything to God, because that's what Paul says in verse 5, they gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. When you've given everything to God, it's real easy to give to others. Because we understand grace doesn't stop with us, but it flows through us to those around us. We become a conduit rather than a container for the grace and the blessing and the mercy of God. Tom, would you come back, please? The standard of giving in the New Testament is found right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Read it one more time with me. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich for your sakes, did you hear that? Though he was rich for your sakes, though he was rich for Steve's sake, though he was rich for Yvonne's sake, though he was rich for Jarvis's sake, though he was rich for Clinton's sake. Oh, come on, put your name in there. Though he was rich for your sake, he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. Oh, say it with me, would you? That you through his poverty might become rich. You see, everything we have flows from grace. And when you and I choose to step up, grab a hold of the promise, apply it in our lives, things begin to change. Oh, I promise If you'll grab a hold of the Word of God and you'll apply it, you're in for an extraordinary life. See, because on the other side of generosity, great things occur. On the other side of generosity, miracles begin to happen. On the other side of generosity, we see God come in and come down. And He touches our heart and He changes us. And then through us, He changes those around us. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed across this room this morning. You're in this place this morning. You've never experienced the grace of Jesus Christ. You've never experienced His great love, His forgiveness. Matter of fact, you always thought that you really weren't welcome in church because you didn't qualify. You didn't measure up. Well, I've come to tell you this morning, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. And because he died on the cross, the Bible tells me he bore your sins and mine. He paid the price for everything we have done wrong so that we could be called children of God. So you're in this room this morning and you haven't asked God to come into your life and Jesus to forgive you of your sins. 
but today you know you need to. This is a moment of transformation when your life is going to turn around because you're going to reach out to Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior. That's you. I'm talking to you. Would you right now slip up your hand and say, pray for me. I need that Jesus. I need that forgiveness. I want that transformation. Yes, someone else. Raise your hand with this one who has. Yes, others. I want that transformation. Yes, someone else. I want that transformation in my life today. Anyone else is awake just a moment. Who slip their hand up with these two or three. Those of you who raised your hands, lift your head, look directly at me. Nobody else is looking around. Just those who raise their hands. See, the Bible tells us if we believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with our mouth that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So I'm not asking you to do something difficult today. I'm simply asking you to believe on Jesus and confess that he is the Lord and Savior and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Are you willing to do that? Nod your head if you are. All right, very good. I'm going to pray with you. God's going to touch you right where you sit. Bow your heads with me across this place and pray this prayer. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you should have. Pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. I ask you to forgive my sins, to change my heart, to come into my life. I ask you to transform me by your grace and your mercy. Make me a new person today. Create in me a clean heart right now. I believe that as I receive you and as you forgive me, transformation is occurring in my life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to audio from Christian Heritage Church located in Tallahassee, Florida. Feel free to give copies of this message to others, but do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. For more information about Christian Heritage Church, please visit us online at chctoday.com.